art trends of Generation X next on this episode of some Cereal for Dinner podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to Cereal for Dinner podcast. I'm your host, Ian C. Earlier this week, I had the opportunity to interview a professor of a local university of the town of which I reside. Um, And his name is Professor Glenn Blakely. And he's been doing art and been the head of the university for years. You know, stories that you're gonna hear for yourself as you hear this interview. And, And we talk about the art and how it affected um, Generation X growing up, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, but due to the nature of the subject matter and just kind of how the conversation went, we went all across the board. We talked about stuff pre-boomers and it's just kind of the nature of the conversation and the nature of the subject matter itself. So it kind of falls a little bit outside of of what, what we're focused here at, on this channel. But it was a really good interview. Uh, and it was necessary to be able to understand what happened in the late 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. What, what happened then was, you know, you had to go prior to that. We had to talk about stuff outside that generation. So before we get to the interview itself, if you like what we're doing here, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share this on your favorite social media. It would mean so much to me. We're dedicated here to uh, bring you really good interviews uh, and and delivering them on a format that's that's the best we can possibly do. And of course, as our viewership increases, so will our quality increase as well. So please keep liking, commenting, subscribing, and sharing on your favorite social media. And if you want to go that one extra step, there's a link in the description box below. Uh, to our buy me a coffee, which is where if you want to donate actual money to what we're doing here to see improvements, as you can see here, I'm finally in that room that I talked about, and I'm trying my best to get it renovated out uh, to do the shows in here at least some of the time, unless I'm you know going on 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 site to interview somebody. But um, that's what we're doing here. So we're 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 working hard to make this the best podcast we can and you can help us by liking comment subscribing sharing your favorite social media and also donating if you feel so inclined every little bit helps so we thank you for that and now to our interview hey everyone this is Ian C and I am here with Professor Blakely Professor Glenn Blakely uh, and is it still called Dixie State University? It is right now. Okay, all right. You know, with these tri- turbulent times and everybody being so touchy-feely, you never know. Uh, you know, Dixie's kind of become a bad word in the common vernacular. Yes. But, so. uh, but it's still called Dixie State University. And we yeah. are today going to be talking about the art of Generation X and what was popular when I was a kid and growing up through the years of the late 70s and 80s and even the 90s and up even to, to today, you know, we can touch on some stuff there. Um, but uh, before we get to that, kind of tell me your story because you, you, you were not always an art professor, were you? No, I was not. I, uh, were you always I interested was, in art? I was always interested in art. Right. I, I was born in the hills of Kentucky in Harlan County at a place called Brookside. My father was a coal miner, and so um, I grew up playing in the hillside and climbing hickory nut trees, and uh, I look back on it, I, I, I feel like I grew up in heaven. Ah. I mean, you there, there, had lots of wonderful friends and lots of things to do and places to go, and I was always interested in art as a small kid, I, you know, at school, when it came to art, that was my favorite subject. I, I loved recess and lunch, but art was <laughs> even better than that. And um, as a matter of fact, at the ages elementary school, 
I won the kite flying contest every year for my grade, but I also won the most beautiful kite. My father had taught me how to take some sticks, uh -huh. weeds, uh -huh. and make a kite out of uh, newspaper. Oh, and interesting. So, so I, I'd make my own kite and paint it, and so I'd always get the most beautiful, and then I would win the kite flying contest. That's awesome. I, so, I did miss one year, though, oh. be, because I was out with the mumps. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. But uh, fortunately, I stayed in the fourth grade two years, so, <laughs> so, got, <laughs> so I, got, years I got my full. <laughs> so when did you land the job as an art teacher here? Well, it was many years later. I, um, after I worked at a newspaper shop uh -huh. in Harlan, Kentucky, while I was going to high school full time, Harlan Daily Enterprise. Okay. And that was a marvelous experience, 40 hours a week. <laughs> And um, during that time, I, uh, I, I loved reading a book, a comic book every time I go to lunch on Saturday, I'd read uh, Rick Estrada's uh, uh, books, uh, comic books, and he wrote uh, Sergeant Rock. And we'll talk about him in a little bit because okay. I met him here. Okay. He came to my office and oh. so we became really good friends. And so I would go to lunch with the, um, um, the pressman, Virgil Powers, mm -hmm. and so he would read Archie, which Rick Estrada was drawing some of those too, and I would read uh, uh, Sergeant Rock. Well, after, uh, at the end of high school, I would put in for a scholarship at Berea, Kentucky, an art scholarship, mm -hmm. and it didn't come, and it didn't come, so I went in the Air Force, been in the Air Force four or five days, and the scholarship came. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so, but it was too late for the scholarship, so. Yeah, the Air Force was in uh, The military kind of. <laughs> they they didn't understand at all. <laughs> <laughs> they're not going to be understanding yeah. as far as that's concerned. So I had a great time in the military, read a lot of books. I loved airplanes. I was an aircraft mechanic, got to spend a year in Greenland, mm -hmm. read a lot, painted a lot of paintings. And that tied into another art experience, but we'll not go into that right now. So I get out of uh, the Air Force. Um, in 64, I joined the Mormon Church. I went on a Mormon mission to Japan. Okay. And they love art. They're very artistic people. Uh -huh. Love simplicity and beauty and beauty in nature. And then I came back and, and went to the University of Kentucky. And okay. Transferred out to BYU. And, uh, and it ended up finishing my BA. And then they offered me a graduate assistantship in ceramics. And so by then I was full-fledged art and, you were uh, full, fully into the art yeah, world yeah, at that time. Yes. And, right. and it's been a great blessing in my life. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed art and yeah. artists uh, all around the world. It's, it's provided travel. It's provided entertainment. It's provided inspiration. And now it's provided this podcast. He's yes, here with yes. us. I mean, this now is got to be the zenith of your career. <laughs> what happens after this, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'll have to go back to school and get more training. Now. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so bring us to uh, getting here at Dixie State University because you've been the art professor here for as long as I can remember. Yes. So is... I, I, well, um, way back in the in the late eighties, as I a came, matter of fact. I, 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 I came to Dixie College in huh. 1976. Okay. I was teaching full time at BYU, but I was a special faculty member. This job came open. They only had one red light in town. They had all these beautiful scenery. This is the Sister Canyon to the Grand Canyon. Yeah. And uh, I mean, this is an artist's paradise. Right. And so uh, uh, I applied for the job and received it and so I've been here this is my 44th year here oh wow and so well you've seen some developments in the art world and the first place I want to go is kind of the contrast uh, between uh, maybe what was popular in art um, in the in the boomer generation compared to what was what was uh, uh, popular in the Generation X. So as you're getting into, you know, you've got these young kids and they're artists and they're growing up and now they're they're becoming their own artists and you know they're becoming 12, 15, 16, starting to paint, find themselves, paint art, and we're getting into say, let's just you know put a year on it, say about 1975 
onward, what's the biggest contrast you see from the previous generation to, to, to um, the art of Generation X? If you don't mind, like, okay. what was that, that, that art like in, in Boomer and the Hippies? And then what was the art like? What's the contrast there? Okay, during the late 70s, there was a, uh, and, and even the late 60s through the 70s, there was a wide range of art. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we should mention Norman Rockwell in the 40s, 50s, 60s, because he was with Saturday Evening Post. He'd been with the Boy Scouts. Uh-huh. And a large majority of the American people associated with his storytelling. Okay. They loved the stories. And uh, in 1973, when Picasso died, um, Norman Rockwell paid him a compliment. He said, he's one of the greatest, most creative people uh-huh. that I have known of. And he said, I am not a Picasso, oh. but I will be remembered for my storytelling. But mainstream art did not like Norman Rockwell. Okay. Because they kind of looked down on him. He's just an illustrator. Okay. He's making money doing pictures for magazines. And by then, uh, people like Jasper Johns uh, had begun to do uh, some of his works, and he would move into the abstract. Uh, flags and numbers and uh, it's more of not the old hat but more of the uh, new concepts new ideas new way of expressing uh, because things were changing and changing rapidly also in the uh, uh, let's go back to 60 1960 for example on TV 80% of all of the TV shows were westerns Okay. Yeah. And the reason for that was when TV started, the most popular shows they could show, because they didn't come on until 4 o'clock in the afternoon and went off at 11, uh, they showed cowboy movies. Mm. And people loved Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and, you know, and um, Bob Steele. And, I mean, there's uh, a lot of those people that were there. Right. Well, because that became so popular, kids grew up with that. Okay. And they see the Western paintings, and from those Western, I mean, not paintings, but movies. So Western paintings became very popular. And so well, that uh, makes sense. in Texas, and Jackson Hole, Laguna, uh, I mean, all around the country, they had shows, and Oklahoma, uh, uh, the Gilcrease Museum, and then, then if you look down at uh, uh, Phoenix, they had a big Western show, and and people would buy. And, I mean, you get two stickers, and one you put on the first painting you got to, and the other one you put on the painting you wanted. Okay. It, and, and that way you got at least two paintings. Mm-hmm. And so they would sell out. But a lot of that was generated because of what people were experiencing and what they were seeing. And so when you uh, get a little farther along, then... Um, the, that begins to change and begins to go away. Okay. And what, uh, from my opinion, back in the late you know, 1800s, uh, you had the Impressionist movement that came along that just blew everything else out of the water. So there was a couple of painters who might have even considered Western paintings, painters like Thomas Morand and Bierstadt. By hmm. 1900, they were considered... I mean, they weren't even considered artists, basically. They were looked down on. and Because uh, of? Because they were doing, they weren't doing the new stuff. Oh, okay. They weren't doing what the Impressionists did. They weren't doing um, what um, uh, Cezanne was doing. Cezanne wanted you to fill the art. Uh-huh. The Impressionists wanted to give you an impression of what you were seeing. Mm-hmm. Cezanne wanted you to fill it. And then by the early 1900s, you've got Picasso and and Duchamp and all of these people that are revolutionizing things. And so uh, in Europe you had Bierstadt, or not Bierstadt, but you had um, Alma Tadema and Bouguereau. Mm-hmm. And by the 19, early 1900s, their works were considered not, not valuable. But because of the cowboy art that happened in the late 60s and 70s, by 1990s, mm-hmm. 
those guys were popular again. <laughs> People, the museums like uh, Denver began to pull their cowboy art out and hang it. Okay. The Gene Autry Museum and L.A. began to display their artwork. Mm -hmm. And so they began to show that. And so all of the art springs from one thing or another. It builds off or it it's a total rejection of what went on before. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. I see, and I, and I was wondering that. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not as connected to the art world as I am to other um, areas that we've explored on this podcast. So I'm not sure, but in a lot of areas, there seems to be a huge contrast to the generation before. Where I'm not sure if that's true in the art world. I don't know yeah. if, if artists in the art world really valued what came before and built on it, or if they did the rejection thing. So like in music, you often have the rejection of what came before and we're doing something new yep. now. Did that happen in the art world too? Absolutely. It happened okay. with the, the Renaissance was rejected. Uh -huh. The Baroque was the new. Uh -huh. And by 1840, when we get into the Industrial Revolution, the whole thing starts to change very rapidly. Okay. And new was important and old was not important. Mm -hmm. Whereas during the Renaissance, the more classical it was, the better you became, <laughs> the better you, you know, the, the, I mean, you had to match the quality of everybody right. else. And so that changed to where what became important was, is it new? Right, yeah. And so that concept has held on. And if you look at uh, commercial art, uh, you know, our commercials are, you know, things of that nature, um, uh, it's always selling something new. Right, right. And so it's the new is good, the old is The bad. old is not. Is, is that, do you think that carries true even to today? Do you find that happening or do you find a much more, I don't know, um, embracing of the past? Or does this still happen today? It still happens. Really? It, that's why you have to have a iPhone 11 or whatever. Yeah. I mean, you got to have the latest. Right, you got to right. have the newest. It, and so we've been somewhat conditioned to that. And that and happens it, in art still. It happens in That's art I, because, see, if you look at car designs, uh -huh. they're art. Yeah. Art Students League in Pasadena, I mean, they design cars and they have, you know, people from the designers come and teach their classes. And so they're going to design a car, but the body will stay the same for about six years. Mm -hmm. But they change stuff on it to make it look like it's been changed. Uh -huh. And the engine, of course, may stay the same for 25 or 30 years. Like yeah. minor changes on it because you can't totally revamp and make everything. And so those same things hold true in the music, mm -hmm. in the art, in the visual art, commercial arts, in graphic arts, uh, and uh, also in our crafts. So, um, so if you can come up with something that is new, it's innovative, and innovative, yeah. original, yeah. It gets scores big points. Do you have the same thing? I know what happens in music is that you have the innovator, the person who's truly original, and you have maybe, you know, five or six, you know, like every 10 years, there seems to be five or six bands that kind of uh, m make some new headway. But then after that, you have like, Oh, you know, three or four dozen co copycats. Yes. Does this happen in art as yes. well, in the art world as well? Yes. In the late 60s, for example, uh, Michael Coleman, uh -huh. by the mid-70s, he was, he was getting $10,000 of painting at the Kennedy Gallery in New York. And what he didn't sell in the first hour went to 30000 because the gallery bought it. So everybody oh. tried to buy one. But that was in like 79. Mm. Um, and, and Michael... And, and, and what kind of art did he do? He, he does uh, both oil and uh, encaustic. Not encaustic. He does uh, gra uh, gouache. Mm -hmm. And they're cowboy, Indian animals. And, you know, very tight, photographic. And so his art... I mean, you, he brought in the Canadian uh, concepts with the uh, colored... Uh, Blankets okay. that, that they wore, and the Indians would have those. Very, very Michael Coleman. I mean, you could spot one, you know, across a football field. <laughs> but you go in any gallery, anywhere in the that was selling Western art, uh -huh. and there was they were carrying a person that was doing knockoffs on Michael Coleman. Uh, Michael Coleman's still doing his art. Yeah, but the 
50, 60, 70 people that were copying his art back then uh, are no longer in the business. Yeah. And so that's what, that happens because, um, one, if you want to make a living, you got to have something that's going to sell. And if Michael Coleman's are selling really well and you're making Michael Coleman's, you can make some money. Yeah, right. But the idea of, of these artists and, and what would happen with your uh, Frank Stella's and Lipton Steins and Andy Warhol and those people, they came up with their art. Yeah their thing, mm -hmm. what they wanted to say. And it spoke very loudly, and it was different than what anybody else was doing. And uh, museums loved it, collectors loved it. And um, at first, you know, it wasn't so hot. Yeah. But, you know. I so mean, so let, let me, uh, there's a couple things I, I want to talk about with the whole art thing. And Forgive me. I mean, I love art. I really do. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an art fan. I look at paintings, but I really don't know too much about the world of art. You know, I'm not educated, in yeah. other words, in that, in that world. But I do know what was kind of popular as I was growing up. And I do know some people who were artists and what they were drawing and what they liked. And, but I'm sure it didn't come out at the time that they were drawing and what they liked and yeah. what I liked too. So talk to me a little bit about MC Escher, because okay. I know that, because I, I mean, when I was a kid, well, not a kid, you know, teenager. When I was a teenager, I had friends who were really good artists and all of them loved MC Escher. And I know yeah. that MC Escher was not, you know, was, well, anyway, he, he came before, but tell me a little yes. bit about well, that. Well, MC Escher is absolutely one of my favorite artists too. I've, I've I've never seen an M.C. Escher piece that I did not right, right, love. Right, I mean, right. it's 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 just something that um, they're just fantastic because of what he was able to do. Mm -hmm. Now, M.C. Escher uh, became fascinated by um, the uh, tessellations that he saw in the Alhambras uh, in the in Spain, and uh, he and his wife and kids were tracing those off of the wall. You know, so they're geometric shapes that mm -hmm. fit together beautifully. And so he goes back home and he, he wants to do those. He's a woodblock uh, artist and, you know, uh, he could have been an architect. He could have been other things, but he loved doing woodblocks and um, uh, he did some mesotents, but it took too much time. And so when he would uh, carve these and, and you have the, the transition like of a a duck going one way, white, the duck going the other way, black. Yeah. And so he, he entered, enter, integrated these things beautifully. But what he wanted to do was to say who he was. Mm -hmm. And and so to him, just the tessellations, uh, just the the Alhambra shapes weren't, weren't enough. Mm -hmm. He took them to a whole different level. Right. If it's a lizard, people are going to relate to it. If it's a person, they're going to relate to it. If it's an animal, they're going to relate to it. And so they become quintessential Eschers. Okay. And then Escher loved mathematics. Uh -huh. And when his stuff started being pu published, uh, mathematicians all over the world began to write him hmm. because they loved his art. And so that influenced him. And then he began to do the impossible um, shapes and uh, you know where they all run together, and that's right. what the stairs that continually go yeah, up yeah. or, or, you know, yeah, or you down. Yeah, go down. You know, or it's just it's, so he it's was fascinating. able to. What was his years? What, 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 well, when was he drawing these things? Uh, in the late thirties, okay. he was doing it during the war. His professor Don Mosquito uh -huh. uh, was killed. Uh, uh -huh. I think he died in Auschwitz, uh -huh. and uh, he kept. Uh, one of his prints uh, in his office with the uh, with the SS troop boot mark on the pr uh, on the print, okay. so he kept that. Um, he and um, then I'm not sure when he passed away, but he was still I think in the 70s, uh, very popular in the late 50s and 60s and was there was there an anti MC Escher revolution at all in art art world because I mean I, you know I was introduced to him in the 80s at least 
And again, everybody seemed to like him. There wasn't anybody going, oh, we don't like that. Like, I hate, keep, hate relating it, keep yeah. relating it to music. But, you know, when the whole grunge Nirvana scene hit, people who were into grunge were looking at bands like Motley Crue and saying, oh, the, the, they, they're horrible. You know, but did that, does that ha happen in the art world? Was there a bit, because M.C. Escher's painting in the 30s, and, you know, it's 1985, and everybody I know loves his art. Is that? Yeah. Well, and I, I can't rightfully say uh -huh. if there was an anti-Escher movement. Or just people or who it, are critics of him or whatever. Well, I, I think it just wasn't the mainstream. Uh -huh. And in order for some movements to continue, I mean, for Norman Rockwell, he wasn't mainstream. Uh huh. But he was everybody's artist. Right. And everybody loved him. Right. He had a chord and with the common people. He had a chord with them. Yeah. And then with Escher, Escher had his following. Mm -hmm. And they were artists and mus you know, and mathematicians and so forth. But I think as uh, he's still popular. Uh -huh. And up at BYU, uh, about two years ago, on November the 18th, my wife and family and I went up to see a show, and fortunately, they had an M.C. Escher exhibit, mm. and uh, I, I was just blown away, uh, blown away because you go to a museum, you may see a Escher print in mm -hmm. a show, or you may see two, but I've never seen a huge collection with some of his wood blocks, and uh, I was just, you know, that's, that's metamorphosis, cool. you know, I mean, it's a huge print done right. on board. And so I turned to a fellow and I said, this is amazing that this show is here at BYU. And, and he said, yeah, it's my collection. Oh, wow. <laughs> he said, there's only... He, there's he only going to be so many people there. <laughs> yeah, and he said um, um, one of the doctors that was with him had been a dentist, uh -huh. had owned 40 Escher pieces. So the Escher pieces are not out because there were people who collected them. Right. And, and so he had a huge collection. He had a private office in San Francisco. He gave me the card, and you could call him and buy a piece. But they had a player piano out in the middle of the room playing songs because Escher always loved classical music. Mm -hmm. And then they had uh, Phillips, uh, Phil, uh, Philip Glass, uh, had written a song, a tribute to one of Escher's, and the player piano played his song and stuff. So you had a big white piano and you had three or four rooms of just Escher. But to answer your question, I, I really, I, I, I think he's popular, uh -huh. but because of it being in private collections, uh, there weren't big shows in museums. Okay. And it, it didn't continue to push in popularity. Oh, okay. And so I don't think anything replaced it because I don't think anybody could. Uh, you know, it's a really. classic. It's like saying, "Can you replace the Beatles?" You know, you yeah. might. It's just like, yeah. It's you might not have a different happen. group, but yeah. You know, the printmaking didn't go away, but it it wasn't as important as it was uh, so, in the past. So tell me a little bit about this splatter art, because I remember in the eighty. This is probably the early eighties that I saw this, where we went to a home. It was a home show or something? I was just a young kid at the time. And I remember everything being, you know, very new. Uh, you know, the, the phone was kind of odd-shaped even. The glasses were a little odd-shaped. And then what was on the walls were these paintings that literally you couldn't tell if it was right side up or upside down. I mean, I don't yeah. mean to be offensive, but I actually even heard that there were times where somebody, less, the artist came in and said, this painting's upside down, but yeah. nobody would know. You know, it was just yeah. the painting that went across the... The wall there. Talk a little bit about that because I know that was that was popular yeah. in the '80s as well. Yeah, talking about that. Greg Abbott, who's a local artist, does trompe l'oeil, paint ceilings. He's painted people's homes in Vegas and you know ceilings and everything. Uh, 1951, they had a show at the LA County, which included Jackson Pollock and Andy Warhol and a couple of the others. And he walks through and he, he the the tags are wrong. Oh. And so this is a 15 year old kid, and so he goes and finds that because it's a day that it's opening. His parents uh -huh. had taken him down because he loved art. And so he found the curator and he said, you got the tags wrong over there. And he said, I, I don't think so. He said, come and look. And the guy said, oh, they are wrong. <laughs> 
But um, Jackson Pollock, uh, the, the wild man from Wyoming, an alcoholic, mm-hmm. um, when, he, when he was in the creative mode, I mean, it was like an orchestral play. I mean, it was like a musician playing music. He dripped the art on. It was action painting. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can stand up close and see how it was created. That's the only art. Everything else removes the creative process as it goes along. Okay. But what he was doing in action painting was laying down these uh, colors on top of colors, and and he was doing the stuff. And at that, in about 1950, 51, he was considered the most creative artist in the, in the world. Mm. That put him ahead of uh, Picasso and Salvador Dali and Picasso. Had, I mean, he was a genius. But what happened with that mm-hmm. is people would look at it and they go like, well, yeah, you know, anybody can pour, you know, splatter and pour on. And when Chuck Close, and Chuck Close is a, one of my favorite artists, I, I would love to meet Chuck Close. Mm-hmm. And he's a paracollegiate now and, and, and he does stuff that's just superhuman. There, there will be no other Chuck Close. I mean, mm-hmm. he's like an issue. Uh, but when he saw Jackson Pollock, I think in 1951, demonstrate, he, uh, he goes home and he says, that's not art. I can't believe that. That's, you know, what's going on? He said, two weeks later, I'm splattering paint on my paintings. And he said, I, I had become uh, like a de Kooning, and I was a bad de Kooning, but here I am now splattering because he had an impact on me. Well, what you're describing in the houses, yeah. and I've seen, I've seen so many people that uh-huh. did horrible copies of what they thought would be something like what Pollock had created, Jack the Dripper, yeah. and theirs were not like that. Uh-huh. And when I look at it, it's, looking, it's like looking at a bunch of mosquitoes coming at you and they're going to get you. Uh-huh. And it hurts my eyes and it, it, it hurts me when, when I look at it, but I've never seen a Jackson Pollock that I didn't go like, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised at that. But I wasn't always that way because I didn't know. And as I became more acquainted, saw his works, and stood up close to them, then they began to talk to me. Okay. And whereas the others say, you know, they talk, but they're not speaking my language. Uh. So, so that's the difference between you know, the, just the splash art, just because it's splash art doesn't make it good. But to the person that has no training, mm-hmm. they assume this guy must be as good as Jackson Pollock <laughs> or better. <laughs> right. Well, could Jackson Pollock also like uh, uh, paint like a regular painting or like oh, he a did. normal normal painting? Oh, yeah. See, I did. don't know. I'm just, again, yes, people are going to listen to this and go, oh, oh, I'm, no, no, I'm no, way no. out of my wheelhouse <laughs> on this one. So just so yeah. you know. But when, so. when he came to New York, uh-huh. and in those days, we just won the war. Uh-huh. And if you wanted to be a great artist, you went to New York. Okay. And if you wanted to sell art in New York, you had to live in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they weren't going to sell it for you because you lived in Wyoming. Uh-huh. You're an old cowboy. You're, you're not, you should be doing Charlie Russell stuff. Not, <laughs> not. So anyway, he moved to New York. Mm-hmm. But he did what we would consider traditional type artwork. Mm -hmm. It was Jackson Pollock work. Mm -hmm. But then he began to do this whole new thing. Yeah. And uh, he did it until he died, I think, in 56. Mm. But um, his works were an extension of who he was. Mm. And uh, I, I mean, you watch him paint, and then you look at his paintings, and it's like music. Yeah. And that's why it happened. Oh, I like it. It was a visual appeal. And I just, yeah. I wanted to bring it up because I know that, you know, the, a lot of these times these people, this happens with ideas too. You know, you, you oh, yeah. get like, you know, pragmatism and uh, existentialism. And they're talking about it in the classrooms way before it filters into the modern media. And so, I'm, you know, I'm seeing that the same thing happened with art. These people are painting way back then, but it doesn't get, you know, to the popular level yeah. until maybe years later. Um, were you a fan of Family Ties, the t- television show Family Ties? Do you remember that show or no? Well, I remember the title of it, 
but <laughs> it was probably in Greenland during part of that time, and okay. Japan part of that no, time. No, this was 80s. This in was, the 80s? This was 80s. Well, in the 80s, I was working 12, 14-hour okay. days All right. at school. So, so, no, I'm not familiar okay. with Family Ties. Uh, I'm going to make, I'm gonna make this relevant then. Okay. Because okay. in Family Ties, the one of the um, um, people who was a frequent guest star on the show, uh, his character was an artist, but he made what, you know, none of the, 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 the family is like kind of this uptight family, kind of, yeah. and then uh, um, the, the daughter gets involved with this guy who's, you know, very n new wave kind of thing, and, you know, he's got the big mullet with the, the long hair in the back and stuff like that, and, uh, and you know, they just don't understand why, they, why he likes them, but one of the things he does in the show is he makes what they kind of they don't know what it is they call it trash art or something like yeah. that where basically he's taking all this stuff and just welding it together or tying it together or you know it's somewhere in between a painting and a sculpture i mean it's not a sculpture because he's not sculpting anything well, it's called an assemblage he, oh an assemblage okay so i i also know that was really popular as i was growing up that that was a big deal i mean you go places and somebody in there you know you on, if they had it on their coffee table or in a mantle or something like that people are like whoa you've got that thing that's yeah. You got three spokes on it from a bike, and then you know some trash bags, <laughs> something yeah. like that. So what's that? Tell, tell me a little bit about where that art kind of came from, and a little bit about the history. Well, if you of that go back art. to the Armory Show in about 1913. Really, when, that long ago? Really? When, wow! When, uh, Picasso displayed and Duchamp. Uh huh. Duchamp did the. Um, um, nude descending the staircase uh -huh. and he also did a bicycle wheel on a stool and uh, this was dataism his stool mm -hmm. and and what what you did was you were anti-war okay and so you know people say oh, that's stupid you can't use the bicycle wheel you can't use the stool that that's stupid and he'd say no building bombs and tanks and guns to kill people, that's stupid. So, so that was an anti kind of war movement with his painting uh, that was um, the nude descending the staircase to President uh, Roosevelt saw it, uh, the first one, mm -hmm. and he said it uh, looks like a, uh, an explosion in a shingle factory. <laughs> and so during that time, so this was all new ideas and it began to move forward mm -hmm. and then and by the time you, uh, you you go through art nouveau with all of that it's that same time but by the time you get into the 60s and 70s um, uh, jasper johns had begun to do a cast mask of his face and targets and flags and so so in the painting and sculpture world that became quite popular so found art mm -hmm. So, so that was a new way. And artists, usually, if, if you haven't been making a lot of money, you don't have a lot of money for supplies and materials and creative people start pushing that and doing things with it and come up with ideas. And so um, Nevelson uh, did a bunch of that during that time. Uh, we have a local artist, Matt Clark, who uh, it does a brilliant job of creating uh, things with found objects, with mm. metal. And uh, when he first started back in the early 80s, it was gluing, a, you know, welding a horseshoe thing with another horseshoe and it's a cowboy hat on. And, and, right, and right. you know, and so I tell him, hey, you've got to do art, <laughs> not, not just, you know, this trivia stuff. And so that became popular then. But if you go to, you ought to go interview uh, Matt Clark sometime because his whole studio, mm -hmm. because he's a paraplegic. Okay. He was in a high school and he was working on his truck and it fell on him and he's been in a wheelchair ever since. But his his studio is a masterpiece of how to move metal mm. and things that weigh tons around. Uh, how to hold your hammer, how to get, how to weld. I, I mean. His studio is uh -huh. an art piece, but but that's kind of, from my point of view, kind of what happened, and obviously there were people uh, who were doing it in the museums, mm -hmm. 
and doing it as installations. Was this was this because I'm I'm fascinated as to why it, you know this is happening back in the 1920s and 30s and thir 1913. Um, what obviously people who are in the know know about that stuff. How come it takes so long to get into the popular eye? What what happens? I mean, is it just was it always in the popular eye, and I'm just ignorant of it, or or because I know that there's this, you know, it was everywhere at one time. What what what's the process that went from 1913 to, well, at least in my opinion, only a handful of people who were in the know knowing about it to 1984, where it's everywhere. What what happens? Well, I think as you go along, people see it, mm -hmm. and people. Um, you know, young people look at it and they go like, hey, I can do that. Uh -huh. That's fun. That, that's great. And then, then it begins to sell and people begin to, you know. It uh, begins to get cool. It's cool to own it. And then, then once that ha happens, it was like the Western art period there in the, in, in the late 60s through mid 70s. Uh, you know, I mean, everybody had to have a Western art painting. It, mm -hmm. it was huge, and it helped bring back realism mm -hmm. in, in many of the ways. Uh, uh, photorealism began to become important, uh, at painting that looks like a photo, and uh, trompe l'oeil had always been popular, but trompe l'oeil came back, and even in ceramics, mm -hmm. you know, uh, David Furman and Victor Spensky and... Um, you know, Shaw and, and others are doing these things that you look at it and you'd say, that's not ceramics. <laughs> that's not, that is not ceramics. That's a box of tools or a bucket of brushes or, you know. And so, so, it, so it came up through, and so you have people in, in all categories of arts that begin to do it. Mm. And then um, some of this concept also came out of Picasso's not cubism, but out of his uh, collages. Okay. So he began to paint and glue paper on and glue, you know, you know, part of wicker baskets or anything to it. And so that moved up through uh, from then. And once people kind of see it, then they want to do it. He took a pair of handlebars mm -hmm. and a bicycle seat and put the head, you know, the, and called it a bull. Okay. So, yeah. You know, right. Right. Yeah. And uh, people look at it and they go like, "Yeah, give me a break." <laughs> but other people look at it and they go like, "Wow, that's that's really creative." Right. And they ask Picasso, "What if somebody else would have come up with that?" And he said, "It would have been just as exciting to me as me doing it." Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of factors that kind of come along, mm -hmm. and then eventually, it, in grade school, elementary school. Uh, you know, they start to do some of the projects, and so then it moves into becoming very popular. Right. Does uh, so? From tell my me, opinion. Yeah. Well, your your opinion it's is the just one. Just my that, opinion. Right. Right. Well, you would you, your opinion would be way more expert than my opinion. <laughs> um, so, was there anything? Let, let's go to the '80s for just a second here, and I want to actually go into the '90s for a second. I have a couple more things I I do want to talk about, but. Uh, is there was there any unique developments that happened in the 1980s, or was it just building on previous things? Was there any innovations you can think of that happened from, let's say, the late 70s to the 90s that that were that were unique to that that people were going, oh, whoa, well, okay, yeah, this guy's I, building something new, or at yeah, least in I, a unique way. I, I think a lot of those artists in the late 60s and 70s that were doing sign paintings in New York, uh -huh. like uh, Lipton Stein and Jasper Johns and, and uh, Rothko and uh, Wayne Tebow and a bunch of those people um, were just, you know, they had to make a living. Right. And, and then their art began to catch on. And then in mainstream, along with Andy Warhol, all of a sudden, that was the place to be. And over a 20, 25 year period, these guys became the master artist. And Jasper Johns, I think, sold one piece off of his easel here about 10 years ago for $40 million. And so, uh, so these guys, and when Liptenstein, I think it was Liptenstein when he died, his, 
his estate was worth 600 million, and in 73, when Picasso died, his estate was only worth 700 million. And the family couldn't pay taxes, so they gave 753 paintings to the French government to offset the taxes. That they oh. So they could retain part of his others. But he collected 2,200 of his own paintings. Yeah. And so, uh, so I think what happens is, um, you know, once the museums, like, you know, contemporary museums became more and more popular, contemporary shows were popular, because they felt like, you know, people are tired of seeing the same old stuff from before, they've seen it before, and we want new shows. The more different the shows were, the Bill Violas who came into play during that time, uh, people like uh, uh, James Terrell, who's been working 40 years on a volcano. I mean, he's, he's a light sculptor. And, and so there's no other, I mean, there are people doing light sculptor, sculptures, but mm -hmm. there is no other James Terrell. Uh -huh. And so you, you look at these people and they just blow your mind with what they're doing. And once you get superstars uh -huh. that hit those places and, and uh, have a uh, you know, response from the public and the museums and the education, then their stuff filters into the textbooks and then, then there's uh, Th then we begin to appreciate them more. Okay, one thing that we have to cover. Okay. Before we, before we, we are a couple things I want to ask you, but I don't. We might have to do a part two at some time. The oh, map yeah. in there all right, <laughs> is comic book art because there was at some point that I know that comic book art was looked at as kind of like the Norman Rockwell, like people like, well, we're not too serious. But today I know that. And there was, a, there was a point, as I was growing up, and I kind of remember this point, at least for me, how I experienced it. And I don't know if from the classroom to the common person where that point changes. But there was a point where these people started being taken, like, seriously. Like, as a serious artist. They're like, people were like, oh, okay, this is good art. This isn't just comic book, Spider-Man, Batman, all that stuff. But suddenly they were going, oh my goodness, this, this, guy, can act, this guy actually has good art. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the evolution of, because you know a considerable amount about comic book art. So yeah. let's just start anywhere. Feel okay. like a, a mosquito at a nude <laughs> beach. You well, start anywhere. <laughs> well, you look back in the 40s and uh, right prior to the 40s, uh, comic books were, were coming in. Uh -huh. And then by the 50s, they were in their heydays. But in the war, we needed heroes, um, you know, and, and you needed Superman, and uh, you needed Wonder Woman. And so the creative people like uh, Spike Lee, or uh, Stan Lee uh, was a genius in developing all of these characters. Now, uh, I've never met him, mm -hmm. but I had a good friend that I had mentioned earlier, Rick Estrada. Now, Rick Estrada was born in Cuba, and uh, he was an artist, grew up doing artwork, and uh, he, he was in college when his next door roommate was Fidel Castro. Oh, wow. And so um, Fidel, once they took over in Cuba, he showed up with 12 tanks at Rick's uncle's house, climbed off of the front one, walked in, and shook his finger in his face and said, you don't ever print anything negative about me again because he was the biggest publisher in Cuba. Mm -hmm. That night, their whole family, all of their relatives left for the United States. Well, Rick was about 19. Of course, he knew Ernest Hemingway from there. Mm -hmm. He knew his daughter. So he went to work for the famous art school in New York. That was the, the one that you know, Norman Rockwell and all of the, you were like 12 really famous artists but he rated the works and so forth. And then he got into comic books and he became like a superhero. He did 500 comic book pages a year. Wow. And he was the pencil artist. Mm. And, in, and I mean, in those days, comic books were huge. I mean, you had racks of comic books and they came out every week. Mm. You had comic books out the yin-yang. Yeah. And so Rick 
uh, was a pencil artist. And with, uh, you'd have an inker who would take the, you know, and do those like with a magic marker. And then you had a colorist, and then you had the person who wrote the story, and then you had another person that could do the lettering. Mm -hmm. Now, he could do all of that, okay. but he was fast at putting Sergeant Rock and his people together, and so that's what he did. Um, as time goes along, he did um, all of these famous characters, Wonder Woman, Batman, Superman, um, you know, he, he did Spider-Man, he did it for the newspaper for Stan Lee for probably six or eight months, and Stan said, you're getting, let him get a little too soft. I mean, he was writing the story and illustrating it. And so um, uh, I met him when he came to my office here in about 1998, 99, mm -hmm. and uh, when he told me his name, I said, well, you're the comic book artist, aren't you? <laughs> I said it, it back in the 57, 58, I was reading your comic books. Right. So then he was probably in his 20s, early 20s. And so, um, so we became really, really good friends. Mm. And he was presented a, a, the National Award for Lifetime Achievement in the comic book world. Oh, wow. And so when uh, Spike Lee, or Stan Lee's um, um, movie Spider-Man came out about 2002 or three somewhere along through there yeah. he called him and said what did you think Rick and Rick says it's a great movie and we'd gone to the movie with him and his wife Loretta mm. and so uh, so anyway um, he he appreciated what uh, he had done and so uh, I think Stan Lee has been a man who has pushed that industry yeah. way beyond what anybody could have thought For possible. Sure. And then now you look at all of the movies, mm -hmm. and you look down through the years, all of the, the movies that have come out of the comic books. So I think to some extent, comic books were replaced by movies, but then when you go to Japan, anime, yeah, and I, I mean, you go to Barnes & Noble, Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they got, they, they got sections. racks and racks and right. racks of uh, feature-length uh, uh, comic books. Right. And so there, there are a lot of people doing comic books. So it's become very popular again, and the artists are recognized for the, what they were able to do. Wow. When did that happen in the academic world? Do you, do you know when that happened then? Like when, when other people of art academia looked at comic artists and said that's good stuff or or because i know that there's a time when it when when it when they was criticized to some degree as just kind of yeah you know, comic um, book art when in the academic world did that change or has it i i'm not so sure that it's changed uh a lot since then i i know there are many schools would look at uh, norman rockwell he's an illustrator you don't want to be an illustrator Okay. And with Michael Coleman, who we were talking about at BYU, uh, the teachers didn't like his work. He was painting the Indians and the teepees and were selling them, and the gallery was selling them and not paying him the full price. And when he found out what they were selling them for $2,700, $2, his neighbor came over and he said, i got to buy one, you got to go to the gallery. And he went on for two or three or four years, and he goes in one day and he says, I need... Here's twenty seven hundred dollars. I want one of your paintings. I can't afford it anymore. And then he says, "Well, they're still selling for five hundred. He said, "Where, where are you, <laughs> Michael? Your paintings are selling for twenty seven hundred dollars, and wow. they've been giving him half of the five hundred uh. and paying him late. Uh. And, and so, uh, not only Crooks. had he received a hard time from BYU uh. because he was painting Indians, but he was making a lot of money. But by seventy nine, he was getting ten thousand painting and he told me he said well if it hadn't have been for that I wouldn't have, I would have never realized the value of my art yeah and so um, so he was able to make a good run with that and so uh, I think in the art world uh, I think photorealism was uh, this huge change where everybody wanted to paint everything so it looked like a photograph Mm -hmm. Now we're into hyper real. Hyper real 
is, I mean, you can have Johnny Debs or anybody and the people do it and it just looks like. Uh, He's sitting there basically, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it looks like a real head photo of uh -huh. that person. Yeah, and it looks more like the person than the photo. Yeah, yeah, I've seen. And that comes out a little bit out of Chuck Close, and his high impact on the art world, but then these hyper real and photo realism. So all of these things are are very popular right now, um, and I think during uh, when, when we when we go back, Alex Katz back in the fifties and sixties was probably the only person in mainstream that was doing anything that looked like a real figure. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you could look at it and say, yeah, that's, that's, that's a, definitely a beautiful woman or a handsome man. Um, whereas de Kooning, I mean, you go like, that, you sure that's a woman? I, I mean, you could tell it was a woman. Right. But it, it was all of the uh, feeling and emotion and, and this uh, uh, creative, parts that he was putting to mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, very, very, very subjective. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was Andy Warhol, who was the first mainstream artist. By this time, I mean, by mainstream, I mean, they're looked at by the museums and mm -hmm. news and that they're, they're coming up. And he wasn't always their favorite person, mm -hmm. but he began to do Marilyn Monroe, mm -hmm. um, you know, Elizabeth, uh, oh, it, it, you know, Mao yeah. Zedong, they had a newspaper and he interviewed people and he did those uh, right. pictures of them. And so that began to uh, bring about some other aspects of it. So there's so many uh, diverse ways that it's gone. Yeah, and, for sure. But uh, on the one question related to in the art departments with comic books, you do a cowboy or Indian. Well, I was told this at BYU. If you draw a cowboy or an Indian in my class, you will flunk. Wow. I don't want a little boy. I don't want a Norman Rockwell. You'll flunk this class. That was what some of the people were saying in oh, the late man. 60s, early 70s. Wow. So they were, so mainstream universities, and I'm sure that was pretty typical everywhere you went. And then the other thing that universities tend to do is uh, you don't want to sell your art. It's, this is spiritual. You're creating it. <laughs> like, what, how am I supposed to make a living if I'm an artist and I can't sell my art? Right. Well, then you become an illustrator. Ah. And so that was, uh, and that's still You're just common. supposed to be famous after you're dead, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll so, sell your art yeah. for you. Yeah. We'll reap the benefits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I, I think Walt Disney had a huge impact mm -hmm. in our art world today. Yeah, that's another a, thing. A whole different down. thing in the animation world. Yeah. And yet Don Bluth, he'd gone 25 years without making a feature-length movie, and Don Bluth made a feature-length animated movie. Uh -huh. And then Spielberg hires him to do The American Tale. And oh, so, uh, I, so I say Don Bluth did more for Disney, and Disney had done for himself in 25 years. But look at the animation world today. Yeah. And look at all of the things that artists based. You go to any superhero movie, any movie, you watch the credits, you got to be in the theater another 10 minutes. And they got a thousand names under this, a thousand names under right, that. Right, right. And it's yeah. all art coordinator, art this, art that. So there's artists are well alive and well <laughs> in our culture. Good. Uh, final question here, uh, and that is, was there any um, trends in art during the late 70s, 80s, and 90s that that should have been bigger, in your opinion, or artists that, that you were like, man, this guy was great, and it didn't go anywhere, or a trend that kind of just went out really quickly that came in, and then it goes out, or does that happen a lot in the art world? Did well, I'm trying to think of... I, I, you know, I, most of the people I liked uh -huh. en ended up being around for a long time. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and I've gone to, you know, I've taken students to LA for f 41 years, 42 years, Huntington, Norton, Simon, we, you know, LA County, LACMA, uh, Getty Center. I, I mean, you name it. And we went there and we went to San Diego. We've been to San Francisco, the Legion of Honor, the Dion, the New Contemporary, the MoMA. 
and Momang LA and Board, Board, Broad Museum. You know, so we've seen a lot. I've taken them to Europe uh, uh, 23 times. And so I've seen a lot that's come and gone. But some of the people, you know, that I've seen that I, I'm sure there's some that I saw that I thought, well, this is going to become really great, but I don't know what happened to it. Mm-hmm. But I know people like, again, Bill Viola, I mean, his stuff is just, it's just overwhelming. Right. And then uh, Terrell and, um, you know, so there's people that by the time they make it into some major museum shows and do some of those things, uh, installations was a huge success starting in the 80s. <clears throat> What's installations? Installations are special shows. Okay. Uh, that are put in. That, I mean, you install any show that you hang, but installations were things uh, like at LACMA, uh, they had an old car in a garage. And uh, mm. I mean, it was like going back into, you know, 1927 or 28 or 30 or 56, and the, the garage would have been there for 50 years. It, and you go from a generic museum into a dirty, filthy, oily smelling radio going. Uh, room and when they took it out, uh, students were angry at me. They weren't angry at LA County. Well, I wanted to see the car again. I, I wanted to see the garage. And so, uh, one of the first ones I thought was that I saw that was really, really impressive was James Terrell outside uh, the um, Giffen Museum in LA. Uh, they had a, a house. And it looked like the parking lot in the city had just removed everything and just left this house out in the parking lot. It had grass, it had a sod, it had a sidewalk. You go in, you sit down, and you lean back, and you look up, and there's a hole in the ceiling. It was open early in the morning and late at night. And uh, it, in the afternoon, the it goes from blue, light blue, to in the light, the room is lit up, over mm-hmm. the ceiling, next to the hole. It goes from light blue in the opening to an orange, and then it goes dark orange. Mm-hmm. And then, then they say, you can't be in here any longer. Oh. Well, we had our whole bus, plus six kids from Seattle in there, trying to watch a helicopter fly through the ceiling. So when the helicopter went across, you know, we could hear helicopters flying outside. So when the helicopter went through what we could see up there, uh-huh. we, we just applauded. I mean, it was great, because you know, a roof doesn't have a hole in it. Now, what right. happened to my wife? Everybody on the bus knew about the Terrell House. Okay. But she didn't know. Was it supposed to be like an art experience it's or something a, like that? A, like it's like, an installation. Okay. It's an art experience. You, you, and this became big in the late 70s, 80s, and so forth. And so um, my wife walks in. There's the six kids from Seattle that came down to spend a whole week. They go over in the morning. It was open two and a half, three hours. They go back in the evening. And they're in there. There's a kid laying on one of the benches. The mm-hmm. benches tilt back. And the other kids are sitting there. And she looks at that and she goes, oh, it's a Dwayne Hansen sculpture. And sculptures, Dwayne Hansen did lifelike sculptures in the late, you know, in the early 70s. They were violent. Mm-hmm. By the late 70s, they're deadpan. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but you, you walk, I walk by a police officer in the Nelson Atkin Museum and I, I thought he was a security guy. The next day, people were looking up his nose. They go like, ah, <laughs> he's a Dwayne Hanson sculpture piece. <laughs> and so she looks at this kid. He's got a baseball cap on, red hair sticking out. And she goes, oh, a Dwayne Hanson sculpture piece. That's why everybody's so excited. Because the guides <laughs> and, the, and the people over in the, the big museum were saying, you've got to go see the Terrell house. And she goes, oh, it's a, it's a James Terrell or it's a, a Dwayne Hansen sculpture piece. And then the foot moved. Uh-huh. And she goes, oh my God, the foot moved. <laughs> and then the kid sets up. And then it's like, uh, what? What is going on here? You know, I, I'm not impressed. I'm supposed to be really impressed. Lady, there's a hole in the ceiling. And she goes, don't give me that. And the kid takes a dime out of his pocket and flips it up through the ceiling. Uh-huh. And so there was a real hole uh-huh. there. And then... Shortly after that, my whole bus loads in there with those six kids, okay. and we see the plane fly over. Now, that's an installation. 
it's there for several months and then it's taken taken away. But he's built a lot of places and he has a whole volcano, volcano in um, down in Arizona that he's done. So, so art just stimulates your mind it does. and your creativity. It does. And so I think, regardless of what people create, it comes from what they've been exposed to somewhere before. Mm. Yeah. So it's an extension of what they've experienced. And so if everybody's doing nail down, tie down assemblages, it's because they've been exposed to it. Yeah. And so anyway, that's well, that's just my point of view. Well, well, <laughs> it's a great point of view. Uh, there are a lot more questions that I have for you, but we'll have to do a part two to this at some point. So I just want to thank you, oh, you're Professor. Certainly Blakely, yeah. for being on the show today. And if you like what we do here at this program, you want to see it grow, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, push that bell notification. If you're listening to this on podcast form, give me an honest review, share it on all your favorite social medias. And if you want to go that one extra step further, I will uh, link to a buy me a coffee uh, page that I have. It's like a, a Patreon where you can people can donate if they want to go that extra extra step and make a donation. Uh, so you can spend some of that hard earned cash on what we're doing here and getting better equipment and more, uh, you know, just improving everything here. So I want to thank you all for doing that, and uh, we will see you again. Thank you again, oh, Professor. You're certainly welcome. Thank right. you for inviting me to your show. Oh yeah, for sure. It's been a, love, it's been a blast. It's I been love a blast. It. Yeah. <laughs> Well, good. Hey everyone, this is Ian C. Just wanted to thank you once again for listening to this podcast. If you are listening to this on podcast form, please remember to leave us a review and a rating. It would mean a lot to me. And also a reminder that we are on YouTube and we do have exclusive video content. And it's actually pretty important on this one because Professor Blakely showed me some personal art from the uh, comic art of Rick Estrada that he has uh, in his private collection. And if you're already on YouTube, if you like this video, you might like these videos too.